Saturday afternoon in Chisnu Central Park. The sun is shining and people are seeking out the shade on benches beneath the trees. Saturday is the day to get married in Moldova and to have your photo taken in front of the fountain. Couples are promenading after the ceremonies in the Orthodox churches. They waltz with the photographers and they dream about a happy future. At Natasha's beauty parlour, the staff are busy. The clients are having their hair done, getting manicures and pedicures. Indulging at a beauty parlour is part of being a real woman in Eastern Europe. I want to be elegant, beautiful and fashionable. They're good at what they do here. Prices are reasonable. If you can afford it in today's Moldova, it feels good to be pampered, to get away from the stress of everyday life. When I start massaging, I can feel if my client has had problems. With my hands, I am doing all I can to remove the bad energies and give her positive energy so that she will leave satisfied and pleased. I can see the result of my work in the faces of my clients. They become younger and more beautiful and the spark returns to their eyes. Ten years after Moldova's independence from the Soviet Union, the capital, Chisnu, sparkles on the surface. Mercedes cars are rolling down the streets. Shops offer goods from all over the world. McDonald's sells food to those who can afford it. The dollar exchange rate is reasonably stable. One dollar gives approximately 12.85 Moldovian lei. Important for people surviving on dollars sent back from family members living and working abroad. And in Chisnu, the women appear well-dressed. But behind the appearance of normality, the expensive cars and so on, Moldova is poor, poorer than any other place in Europe. Once, most of Moldova was part of Romania. Stalin and World War II changed that. Moldova was annexed and incorporated into the Soviet Union. Now Moldova lies isolated and forgotten, squeezed in between Romania and the Ukraine hidden away from the affluent west. That is why there's no spark in the eyes of people in the central market in Chisnu. Here, people are engaged in a tough struggle for survival, in a society when few can survive on their income, and where for years, pensioners have waited weeks and months to receive their inadequate pensions. Here, they have to trade anything that might put at least some food on the table. I have to struggle to provide for my family. I brought some boxes from Ukraine, but the police confiscated them. They should just give us jobs. I sell tin cans and margarine to provide for my children. I can't pay my bills. I can't afford even an ice cream for my children. I make 30 lei per month. I can afford bread, but not meat. Why do you think Moldova has become so poor over the last 10 years? It's all Gorbachev's fault. You can take my apples for one lei. I'm, I'm going home now. It's all Gorbachev's fault. When the communists were in power, I said, can't you see what is happening? And I was right. Nine years ago, Moldova was hit by civil war. Today there is no genocide, no natural disasters, there is just endless poverty. No one cares about Moldova. Every fifth citizen lives beyond the cash economy. 
Half the population lives below the poverty line. Here, people sell organs and women to provide for their families or go abroad. The Moldovans voted the communists back into power in the spring. Welcome to Moldova, 10 years after independence, the poorest country in Europe. At the maternity ward at the municipal hospital, the national tragedy affects them even at birth. Only four out of every ten babies are born in proper shape. The rest are born with deficiencies related to the social decline. A lot of people suffer from chronic diseases without any possibilities of having them treated or being operated on. This means that both the actual illness and the overall health conditions are being aggravated because most of the expenses must be paid by the patients themselves. The birth rate in Moldova has fallen dramatically. They used to handle 12,000 deliveries a year at this hospital. Today, they carry out just 6,000. The birth rate has halved in 10 years. People can only afford one child, two at the most. Very, very few have a third child. Most people have only one, and one in five have a second. Maria Basok is 28 years old. She receives £3.50 a month in benefits and is one of the very few Moldovans having her third child. Not that she wanted it herself. We are poor. We live a tough life in the countryside, but we're used to it. Sometimes we have money, sometimes not. That's our fate. Why do you want another child of your life is difficult. We have two small girls and my husband wanted a boy so much. Do you know what it will be? No, we don't. The view over Chisnu blurs the poverty. The Soviet blocks may look impressive at a distance, close up, and inside, they hide poverty of enormous proportions. Every single working Moldovan supports three that don't work. Four out of five pensioners receive less than four pounds a month. Alina and Irina Samartina are mother and daughter. Once they were in a tight little family, enjoying the good life with jobs and cars. Then the father moved out, savings disappeared, and their bank collapsed. Today, they live with their grandmother, Maria, in a two-room apartment, and the three women live on just 16 pounds per month, and it's impossible. A lot of the inhabitants in the block owe on the heating, so they switch the heating on and off. But I can't pay 17 pounds a month for heating. What kind of food can you afford to buy on yours and your mother's income and pension? The cheapest oatmeal, bread and milk. Alina taught herself to sew and gets by as a seamstress. But this has never been officially recorded, so it won't help her to get a proper job. Besides, she's now 44 and too old. During better months, she can make about £10, but that doesn't even cover the gas for cooking. They came to our home and switched off the gas because we hadn't paid. They said that when we had paid, they would turn it back on. We have other problems because we owe money. My biggest debt is for the elevator. Our block has nine floors. They close the elevator down and the neighbours call the administrator and ask when they would open it up again. He answered that one apartment owed money. Ask her, when she pays, we'll reopen it. Only young Irina is still clinging to her dreams of a better life. She wants to be a lawyer, but there are no more free places at Chisnall University.
she will be left with the choice of so many other Moldovan girls of whether to go abroad or not. I will not leave my mother and father, nor do I want to leave my friends. It might be interesting abroad, but it depends on why you go. It would be good to study abroad. You get a much better education there than you do here. But I wouldn't like to work there. I hope she will get a different life from mine. Of course, I wish her to find the right path. I want her to succeed and fulfill her wishes. Alina has every reason to be worried. On the streets of Chisnu, billboards warn women of the risks of being sold as prostitutes. And UNICEF is financing a centre and a hotline where women in trouble or under threat can get assistance. When we visited the centre, an elderly peasant woman was waiting. Her daughter had been on her way to Greece when she was jailed in Romania. She was supposed to work there. She's divorced with two children. Here, everyone's unemployed. Very few of the Moldovan women who go abroad are aware that they have been sold as prostitutes before they leave, often by people they know. One category of pimps is the close family members. They might even be cousins. We're astounded that some of the pimps may be the girls' boyfriends, their future husbands, who were supposed to love them. At Save the Children's Centre in Chisnu, kids are playing all over the yard. Mariana heads the centre. She organises medical treatment and psychological care for the battered women and children. She helped this young woman, who wishes to remain anonymous, get back on her feet. The girl who'd left Moldova together with me said that I should go to Pogdorica with a gypsy woman and we would meet there. When we arrived there, I asked for Allah, but I was told that Allah wouldn't show up, that she'd gone back to Moldova. A man told me that I'd been sold to him and he told me what I'd have to do. I started to cry and said I wanted to go home. But he'd already sold me to two other men. I also told them that I wanted to go home. But they put a gun to my head and threatened to kill me if I continued making trouble. Then they brought me to a house in Pogdorica, where they kept another girl from Moldova. We were there for a week. We told each other how we'd ended up there. We were there for a week. We had to sleep with some men. We had no other choice. Before she left, she had no idea of the risks facing her. She had been sold by her friend and was sold again and again. She had a miscarriage and an abortion after being abused in a police station in Albania. When she finally returned home, she had been beaten and maltreated for more than six months. Society blames her for being a prostitute, but no one asks why she became a prostitute. It all starts with total lack of concern and attention, or it simply comes from poverty. A lot of people are in such a situation that they don't know how to provide for their family and their children. We went to the village of Mingir in the southwestern part of Moldova to look for a young man who was ready to step forward to tell his story. Today, Nikolai Barden has a small house in Mingir, but he hasn't lived here for very long. His situation was dire and he was forced to act. I did it for the sake of my son. 
He asked me, where do we live? We lived in four different places, so he couldn't figure out if we had a home. And he's growing, and he must have somewhere to live. Nikolai has seen others in Mingir suddenly getting wealthy. He heard about a woman who organized the selling of organs and contacted her. His wife Vera and son Vioral stayed at home. When he was escorted to Istanbul to sell a kidney for $3,000, afterwards he felt cheated. They cheated me. They didn't pay me very much. First, we bought the house. Then we paid our debt. And we bought firewood to heat the house. Then I bought a bicycle and some other things we needed for the house. All the money simply vanished. The day we visited Nikolai, the family had no cash in the house, and today Nikolai is physically weak and unable to carry heavy loads. If I carry more than, let's say, 20 to 30 kilos, my remaining kidney hurts. If we have to do any heavy work, my wife has to help me. One day, after I'd worked three hours in a row, I couldn't get out of bed. It's tough. In Mingir, at least 30 people sold their organs before the police stopped the practice. In towns, poverty often stays hidden. In the countryside, poverty is obvious to everyone. During communism, Moldova was isolated, cut off from the outside world, and was totally unprepared to face the reality of the new world 10 years ago. During the first few years of independence, the consequences were limited. Moldova continued exporting its cultural production to Russia, but the Russian economy collapsed in 98. Moldova's vulnerable economy came crashing down too. Agriculture, the foundation of more than half of Moldova's export earnings, came to a halt overnight. Newly privatized farms collapsed. Production plummeted to levels lower than during World War II. Moldova used to be the biggest tobacco producer in the Soviet Union. Now the export is less than half of what it used to be. Tobacco leaves used to hang here for drying, but now only a little is left. The wine districts in southern Moldova have been hard hit too. Once, half of all wine produced in the Soviet Union came from these vineyards. But as Russia collapsed in 98, so did wine exports. And when the fortunes finally seemed to look a little better this year, frost hit the blooming plants and yield plummeted. Back in Chisnu, the police managed the traffic. The politicians, however, have a somewhat tougher task trying to manage an economy with hardly any income. Sections of Chisnu have been dug up by the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. The bank is financing several projects, among them a new central heating system to replace the old Soviet-style one. Energy and heating is expensive in Moldova because they are totally at the mercy of their sole supplier, Russia. Marina Katruta is the bank's representative well, I would say that there are some positive signs, and the positive signs are that there are a lot of entrepreneurs, people who are self-made, who are now thinking different, who uh, don't count all the state, who want to take the initiative, who want to change things. And, you know, as EBID, we are working closely with local banks who are trying to structure some programs for SMEs. And we could see that the demand is growing. Astraline is one of these glimmers of hope. The textile factory is located in Chisnu, in what was once the canteen of a Soviet factory. Two years ago, Nikolai and Margarita Kushnir hired 20 sewers. Today they have 180 employees and their pride an embroidery machine. They only produce for export, 
The domestic market is non-existent for clothes made of imported fabric, but it is difficult to export to the West when you produce in Moldova. First of all, it takes months to get a visa. Then, the producers still have to overcome Western scepticism. They had no confidence in us. When we first signed the deal, they didn't expect us to succeed. Everything was wrong with us and with our mentality, they said. But then the results proved that we could do a good job and our contracts have produced very positive results. But one success story does not solve all the problems in this, the poorest country in Europe. International organisations lie next to government offices in downtown Chisnu. The UN delivers aid and advice and is working hard to dismantle potential ethnic and political conflicts before they explode. The World Bank and the IMF have lent substantial amounts of money to Moldova over the last 10 years. And now they must pay these loans back. This year, the Moldovan government is supposed to pay 40% of the GDP in debts and interest, rising to 70% next year. The Moldovan electorate voted the communists back into power in February and gave them an absolute majority. The president's chief political advisor, Victor Dorez, questions the effectiveness of the World Bank's loans on his stricken country. I believe there is still some life left in the patient. In many ways, the prescribed cure didn't give the expected results, rather the opposite. But it's hard to say whether to blame the IMF, the World Bank or our own governments. They prescribe a cure, but if it doesn't help, they ought to try something else. But if you use the same cure year after year, the money is lost. To make Moldova's impossible situation even worse, the country is divided along the river Dnistr into Moldova proper and Transdnistr, the communist breakaway region east of the river. Before Stalin's annexation of Moldova, the region east of Dnistr was part of the Ukraine. After the annexation, Moldova and Transdnistr became one republic in the Soviet Union until its collapse. After a brief but bloody civil war in 92, the country was divided. The wide boulevards in Tiraspol are half empty. Monuments of various kinds remind people of past heroes and battles. There are monuments to the dead and for the glorious tanks. The two presidents, Smirnov from Transdnistria to the left and Voronin from Moldova, meet regularly, assisted and guided by the European Organization for Security and Cooperation. The day we visit Tiraspol, the two presidents signed three agreements, but they don't like each other and the conflict is explosive. Today, 45,000 tonnes of Soviet military equipment and ammunition is stored in Transdenistra, supposedly controlled by the Russians as long as they stay. Smirnov claims that it all belongs to the people of Transdenistra, who refuses to give it up or even destroy parts of it without compensation, or to let the Russians' forces withdraw. Legally, it belongs to the people of Transdenistra. Will you assist in the destruction of some of this weaponry? We do not want the Russian army to withdraw from here. The presence of the Russian army is the only physical guarantee we have, except for all the political statements and all the proclamations being issued of all the other parties as guarantees. In 92, the conflict was about ethnic aminosities. Now, it's mainly just economics. Shmurnov controls Transdenistra's economy through his company, Sheriff. Sheriff owns gas stations, supermarkets, and is at present building a gigantic stadium with two swimming pools and a hotel for tens of millions of dollars. Moldova is desperate for this kind of industry and it's set up across the river.
Until the conflict can be resolved, soldiers still need to patrol along the rivers. And rebuilding this bridge across the Dniestra is a step in the right direction. Back in Moldova, Viktor Doras, the political advisor to President Voronin, can take stock of his country's situation. One in five live outside the cash economy, one in two live below the poverty line, and every third Moldovan in the workforce has left the country. Even though Europe would like to turn a blind eye, it is impossible to ignore this poor country in the middle of Europe. Returning to the churches in Chisnu, weddings continue. The young ones will have to rely on help from the parents if possible, and they'll probably never have more than one child. They are, however, still full of hope. I hope that we will be happy together, and that we will have a future where we're happy and healthy, and we'll see our dreams come true.